great. So here we have, um, I just like to let you know that a um, number of years ago, I got hired on as the a naturalist for the city of Calgary Parks Department. And when I was able to do that, I got involved with doing nature hikes. I did that through the uh, Calgary Parks, principally for the Inglewood Bird Sanctuary. And that was um, up in, from, two, what was it, 1986 to 2003. And then since 2003, I've been running my own little business called Alp and Glow Nature Hikes, which has given me an opportunity to take people on hikes uh, out in Kananaskis and Banff and that sort of area for the last number of years, including some overnight trips to the various lodges. So um, I thought I'd put together a little uh, slideshow here for you, uh, perhaps just to give you a, a hint of what is possible out there for this coming summer if you're into hiking and I and um, give you a sense that yeah there's lots of opportunities in the next little while to, to get out and enjoy the, the highlands of, of our Rockies to the west. So uh, just to give you an idea what we're going to be covering we're going to be looking at the, some of the interesting hikes I've been on from Waterton through the Kananaskis country uh, a Cinnaboyne area into uh, a Banff and also into uh, Yoho uh, National Park. So let's kind of go down to Waterton. I, I'm sure lots of you have been there or certainly know of the place. Uh, I always think it's kind of a hidden gem within Southern Alberta because uh, it's got lots of good hikes, et cetera, a variety of nice flora and fauna to look for. And it's relatively a quiet area uh, compared to some of the other places such as you know, Banff and Jasper. So it's a fabulous place to go to. This is a photograph I took from the Bears Hump, which is a good little climb up uh, to give you an overview of Upper Waterton Lake. And one of my favorite hikes uh, initially to go in here is to head across the lake on a boat over to Crip Landing, which is sort of kind of in this area right here. Uh, from there, you can hike up to uh, Crip Lake. Uh, it's a very, very popular hike. Uh, you get on the boat, there's two sailings run from uh, nine o'clock and at 10 o'clock and it takes you over there. But you have to remember, you have to get back to Crip Landing for the boat to pick you up at the end of the day. So that's just something you always have to keep in mind. So here we are, come across the lake from the town site, uh, getting off our, our, little, our little boat. And then we're going to be heading up on a pretty uh, kind of a moderate hike, um, maybe eight kilometers or so up to uh, uh, basically the border with the United States to, uh, to Crip Lake. There's a variety of very interesting spots to go to uh, along the way. There's the Twin Falls, there's Burnt Rock Falls, but the main objective is actually at the top of this waterfall. This is Crip Falls. It's got to be one of the highest waterfalls in the national park system, uh, I, would, I would suspect, certainly in, in, in Alberta. Uh, so you have to approach and somehow get above that cliff band to get into where the lake is. But there is a secret little area that you can go to, and here's a view of it. It's basically uh, across the scree slope, um, and then you have to climb up a ladder to get into this tunnel. So about maybe, oh, let's say 20 meters long, 60 feet long. It gets pretty dark in there, but not completely dark. And it's almost narrow enough that you can only get one person through at a time. So there can also be a, quite a, a log jam or people jam of people trying to get through the, through the tunnel because if you get lots of people coming back and other people heading in, you kind of have to wait your turn a little bit. You crawl through the tunnel, hope you don't bang your head on the, on the ceiling, and then you come up to the other end and you've got this somewhat sketchy little uh, little cliffy area to, uh, to climb up briefly. There's a chain there that you can see that you can hold on to. Um, and then that takes you right up into the, the basin itself. Now, I should let you know, um, a lot of these, some of these pictures I took are actually on slides and I tried to scan them on my machine here. And they didn't quite, out, quite as sharp as you might be, be used to but they are a, a nice uh, idea anyways of what it's like. So Crip Lake is right on the border with the United States. So if you walk to the back of the lake, you will be actually in the United States, but in this case, you don't have to have a passport or even a, maybe a vaccine <laughs> proof or something like that. Um, so that's kind of a bonus. But when I was doing this little walk initially, I put my pack down on a rock and I started walking around the edge of the lake. 
And I thought I'll look back just to see how my pack was doing. And the pack started moving on me. And I didn't think it was that windy. So I kind of thought, well, maybe I should go back and check it. And as I got closer, one of these guys jumped out of my pack <laughs> and, and a friend of his. These are Colombian ground squirrels. So I certainly learned my lesson early on that you probably not best to leave your pack unattended um, when you're out moving around in, on the landscape. So it was kind of a fun thing to see. But uh, anyway, so. Uh, let's move on to uh, uh, perhaps my favorite hike in Waterton is from Cameron Lake up to Carthew Summit. It's a pretty steady climb up through uh, old growth forest, which might actually not exist anymore because of the fire they had there. Um, up into a nice sort of alpine area. Here's your old growth forest, which is quite nice to go through. And then you get up into the more alpine areas, getting out of the tree line. Now you're going to have a nice big view looking at uh, Mount Custer. Uh, in the background, and you can start climbing up higher and eventually you get up onto Carthew Summit. Beautiful, beautiful views looking into Glacier National Park, uh, a classic cirque that you can see in the background where the glaciers carved out, carved out a basin and now it's got a nice lake in there. So this is a view kind of looking, uh, I guess, to the to the west. And then if you turn around, you get this nice view looking to the east down to Carthew Lakes, all the way down, I think Mount Crandall, and then the prairies in behind. And as you know, Waterton is noted for having the prairies that run right up against the, up the mountains. There's not much in terms of foothills there. Um, so it's kind of a neat place to be that way. And nice thing about Waterton as well is the color of the rocks. Uh, you'll see in one or two other photographs I might have, they have lots of greens and pinks, and these rocks are actually quite old. You know, you think of Lake Louise with rocks that are maybe 500 or so million years old, but in Waterton, those rocks can be as old as a billion and a half in age. They sort of formed in just after uh, North America kind of, or Australia kind of uh, left the shores of North America. Um, so it uh, goes back way back in history there for sure. One of the features of the uh, Carthew Summit, it's really good for alpine flowers, all different varieties, quite colorful, but the, uh, the flower that we, like to see if you're a flower person is the uh, pygmy poppy that grows on the scree slopes up on Carthew Summit. Uh, this is a picture that was I took off of iNaturalist. Um, so it's a great time to go up there around, I guess, probably mid July or so and, and hope that you might come across this beauty that's quite uh, rare in, in Alberta. It's kind of probably hung on for after the glacial age and it's scattered here, here and there, but it's never quite common for sure. So uh, the other hike I like in Waterton is Roe Lakes, that's R-O-W-E. You go up across again, these nice red rocks initially, and you get up into these meadows. Again, this, I apologize, it's a little bit fuzzy because it's a slide, but um, every seven years or so, Waterton is blessed with a profusion of bear grass fabulous flower i think kind of around like three feet high or thereabouts and it will just cover every open spot so it's a treat to see you kind of have to time it as i say i think it's around every seven years or so it re it'll really get lots and lots of them so nice to see though if you're if you have that opportunity and it's unique to the southern uh southwestern corner of alberta you won't get it up in uh, you know banff or kananaskis uh, Waterton has lots and lots of nice flowers, interesting flowers to see. So they, they kind of get a, a climatic uh, influence from being close to the BC border and a relatively low pass. So you get a lot of uh, influence from the, from the west. And so we have the red monkey flower and the yellow monkey flower along the along Roll Creek. Higher up, you get into an upper basin before you get to Roe Lakes. And when I was there the one year, the basin was completely covered in fireweed to give you this beautiful pink carpet. It was fabulous to see and wander through there as you started climbing higher up to get to Roe Lakes itself. And here's a photograph I took looking down onto Ro, Upper Roe Lake. Um, so you, it's just a neat little place to kind of clamber up to and, and get a nice view. So uh, I recommend that. So Crip Lake, Cameron Lake to Carthew Summit, and Roll Lakes are certainly good choices to take when you're down in, in Waterton to go for a hike. And at the end of the day, you can come back, maybe climb up on 
uh, bear's hump to get a nice uh, view of the, of the sunset. You'll notice on the left there, the trees are all pink. So back in the early 70s, late 70s, when I took this photograph, they were infected with pine beetle. Um, but, um, you know, did a lot of damage for a bit, but uh, all the trees tend to recover. So, um, but it was sort of a, a premonition of certain a sense of what, we, what we've been dealing with uh, the last few years up here in our part of the world. And then you can just go down after, after a nice dinner, sit by the lake shore and skip rocks and, and really enjoy the environment of, of water tent. So hope you can get down there sometime this year. This is a, actually a Parks Canada image of the big fire that they had. You can see the red areas are the very you know, extreme burnt areas. So um, Crip Lake was is on the east side of the uh, upper Waterton Lake was not affected by the fire. Uh, Row Lakes, which is off kind of in here, the Yakimina High Highway, I understand, is now open. This is a Yakimina Highway that comes along here. Uh, Row Lake is, uh, looks okay, but you probably have to work your way through some burnt areas. And here's Cameron Lake, and Carthew Summit would go up through this big burned area up onto the summit. And you could continue on all the way down past Carthew Lakes, Alderson Lake, back to the town site. That's a, a good hike. Um, but some of the areas certainly is going to be burnt and I have not been down there since the fire so I, I, I can't say what it looks like right now, but I hope to get down there sometime this year and, and explore the area a bit more and see how the area is recovering from the fire. So anyways, that's Waterton. We can go up into the Kananaskis country area now that probably you're most familiar with perhaps. Um, some of you may know that Kananaskis country is a quite a large area. I think it covers somewhere in the order of 2,000 square kilometers. It sort of extends from the uh, road that goes west of Chain Lakes in the south, all the way up almost to the, well, to the Trans-Canada Highway, and then from the Continental Divide out to areas just west of uh, Bragg Creek and, and, and Turner Valley. So it's quite a large area, but I should emphasize that uh, not all of it is a park. A lot of people think that Kananaskis country is a park, but certainly there are lots of parks. You can see them listed down there in the, on the left there, there's, you know, uh, Bow Valley Park and uh, Prealahi Provincial Park, Spray Lakes Provincial Park. There's just a ton of parks, but a good portion of Kananaskis country is not in a provincial park. Um, it's open to grazing, uh, perhaps logging. Uh, I'm not sure if they do oil and gas exploration there anymore. Uh, Off-road vehicle use. Uh, so there's a variety of other uses, mostly toward the east part of the uh, of Kananaskis country. So just to be aware of that, uh, as I always like to say, it's it's not all a park as we would maybe consider a park to be. But let's go for a hike in, in Kananaskis country. The first place we'll go to down in the south is Plateau Mountain. Um, it's an area that uh, was not glaciated uh, during the Great Ice Ages, uh, but you had lots of sort of Arctic features on top of this high plateau, which is around 8,000 feet or so in altitude. And these are rock polygons that you can find along the, the plateau of, uh, of Plateau Mountain. Uh, access to Plateau Mountain used to be not too bad. You used to drive down the forestry trunk road to uh, a road that would take you off uh, heading up toward the top of plateau and you would be an upper gate that you would have to park and then from there you would hike along the road up onto the plateau uh, but that uh, road is no longer open to the public so that means you have to walk the road from the forestry trunk road for about four and a half kilometers before you actually get up to the um, sort of the alpine area uh, you can ride your bike up there, you could ride horses up there, but apparently you can no longer ride, uh, take a car up there, unless you certainly have special permission. So anyways, Plateau Mountain, lots of alpine areas, and I can find my favorite flowers up there. One of them, which is the Moss Campion. Some of you probably see this Moss Campion. I always think if you're walking Moss Campion, country, you're not in heaven, but you're pretty darn close. <laughs> so uh, I would recommend if you do get close, uh, see some moss campion, is to actually get your nose right down to it. It has a very sweet uh, perfume, very, very nice. So uh, next time around, maybe sniff around a, a moss campion, but certainly don't step on them because they take forever to, to reach the, the, the size that uh, we're looking at in this photograph. The other uh, flower I really love is the alpine flower is the purple saxifrage. Small little green leaves, you know, cluster to the ground, but they produce these beautiful big purple flowers. Um, some of you may know that this is the territorial emblem for Nunavut. 
So if you're having a dinner conversation and you would like to kind of, you know, let people know of your uh, knowledge level, you can always say, you know, did you know that purple saxifrage is the uh, territorial emblem of Nunavut? And that should probably set off a good conversation with your dinner guests. So <laughs> kind of fun to do. Anyways, let's move up a little further north. Um, there's you know, the Highwood um, River flowing uh, out from the mountains, going to Longview area. There's a, uh, a Longview Road, Highway 541, that goes through the area, and there's lots of little hikes off of there. Uh, one hike that a lot of people go on is Grass Pass. So you this, I took this picture when the uh, Sentinel Day Use area was still damaged by flooding. But right now you can park at the Sentinel Day Use area just off in the distance there and then hike up from there. So Grass Pass is a pretty steady climb up through a mix of uh, aspen and uh, spruce. There's some good Douglas fir trees there and you can wander up onto the pass itself, which is always a great view. Looking down onto the highway and off to Zephyr Creek and on the, across the Highwood River, uh, there's actually you can wade across the river and go to Zephyr Creek and look for the Indian uh, pictographs that are on there. There's a kind of a little uh, uh, cultural site there as well. So uh, you have seen elk in the area, um, so you can look for those guys uh, moving around through through the uh, through the uh, open areas. The feature of Grass Pass is a tree known as the Boundary Pine. It's featured in a book by. R.M. Patterson called The Buffalo Head. And I certainly recommend that if you are interested in reading local literature that kind of explores some of these areas, get your, get your hands on to a, the book called The Buffalo Head by R.M. Patterson. And he talks about all this area and all the interests in other areas in this portion of, of Kananaskis country. Uh, limber, this is a big limber pine, could be six, 700 years old and is a heritage tree. It was designated a heritage tree a, a few years back. So get a chance to get up there and take a peek at it. It's got lots of stories to tell, I'm sure. Um, while you're up on Grass Pass, you can always, so lots of good flowers there. Great place to uh, linger over a nice afternoon and um, maybe enjoy some of the butterflies who are enjoying the, uh, the area as well. These uh, fritchell areas are having a little bit of a, a nice afternoon delight sort of thing. So check out the butterflies when you're at Grass Pass. Let's move on up further north here a little bit. We can uh, go to, submit a couple of people here. We can go into uh, the Sheep River area. And this is the Sheep Falls, a uh, nice little spot, good picnic area there. This is west of Turner Valley. And if you have a uh, chance, you might get lucky to see uh, kayakers going over the waterfall. Um, so um, keep an eye out for that. But it's a great place for, for hiking, particularly if you live in the south part of the city, because it's a pretty quick way to get down there to Turner Valley and turn west and get into the, into the Sheep River Valley area. Okay, my slide seems to have stopped. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, it's a fabulous place to go in the fall. The end of September, when the aspens all turn color, so like the last week of September, first week of October, this is the view you have as you're driving in on, on the road into the, into the foothills and into the mountains. Uh, it's a great place to, uh, to spend some time and perhaps avoid some of the crowd that people are going up into the higher mountains looking for larches. This is a, a one trail I really like there is called the Foran Grade Trail. It's uh, about a 10 kilometer loop, or you can just go up for a little bit and come back down again. It gives you a great uh, it's a little ridge walk, gives you a good look uh, going to the west, and you can get the colors again in the fall. And that sort of grassy slope that you're seeing up to the right is uh, Windy Point. And that's a place some of you may know where um, people have been monitoring hawk migration for decades. Uh, Wayne Smith, uh, uh, Ray uh, Wurschler and others have been up there almost every fall and perhaps every spring, certainly every fall, monitoring the hawk migration through that area. And Nature Calgary once or twice have had uh, outings up onto uh, Windy Point. I think Peter Roxborough ran a couple of outings that way. So. Um, but when you're walking around or hiking in, uh, along those open slopes, you might have a chance to see one of these guys. It's, uh, that area is noted, the Sheep River Sanctuary is noted for the bighorn sheep. 
And normally you really can't get this close to a sheep, but you know, you know, you, often what happens, of course, is you take a picture from the roadway, you think, well, maybe I can get a little bit closer, you take another picture, you go a little closer, take another little picture. The next thing you know, you're, you're right in the, uh, the zone of, of, the, of the animal itself. So I got this photograph here, a total photo lens as well, but uh, we had a good conversation. We sat, we, we, we chewed the grass or the fat as such and enjoyed just a nice afternoon. And he actually gave me a little gift to take home with me. <laughs> was a uh, Rocky Mountain wood tick. So um, when you're up in those grassy slopes, particularly, you know, May and June, they're about, you kind of have to watch for these little hitchhikers that might come along and provide a little extra excitement um, <laughs> for your hike. So I always have a tick check at the end of the day in, in some of these open areas sort of thing. But not all the uh, sort of the buggy things are all, are all that bad. I came across this nice uh, clear wing hawk moth on my hike up Foran Gray Trail. Uh, just a beautiful little animal, uh, just kind of a nice little animal to, to, to look for, for sure. So I thought that was kind of cute. Anyways, um, we, uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah. So other animals to look for when you're hiking in those areas. One is the, uh, uh, the deer. There's lots of deer in the area, uh, as well as sheep. So you have the mule deer on the, on the left and, and the white tail on the right. Uh, the, I, the white tail is one I, I took from a, a book. I, I have not had the luck of photographing one jumping along like that. But there are um, predators out there as well. You can sort of down in the bottom there, there are the, the cougars, uh, the mountain lions that you might come across. I was very extremely lucky to see some, this, for example. Um, so, uh, but actually I confess, I took this picture at the, the Calgary Zoo. So I, I've never actually seen a cougar in the wild. I have seen cougar tracks. I saw a place uh, where an animal was killed by a cougar, um, where it had stored its, uh, it's uh, prey under a bunch of leaves and, and grass and that sort of stuff. So uh, I must confess, I've never seen a cougar in the wild, but one day, well, if I'm lucky. <laughs> Anyways, uh, if, if you take the Sheep River Road right to the end, to the junction day use area, you can walk along the old forestry road that used to go from the Sheep River all the way through to the Albo uh, Lake and down into the Kananaskis area or Kananaskis Valley. It's a nice place to walk along, uh, wide, you can you get good views. Uh, here's a nice view looking uh, west to Mount Gibraltar. And Gibraltar, Mount Gibraltar, sorry, Gibraltar, um, that face that you're looking at was first climbed, I think about, um, I'm going to guess in the late 50s. But to climb it, the climbers back then didn't, you know, maybe had quite the technique that people they have now in the equipment. So they used what they called aid climbing, which means you basically kind of put a piton into the rock, hang a ladder off of it, and you climb up that ladder, and then you put another piton and you keep doing that. It took them somewhere around seven days to climb that, that face. So that was quite the undertaking back in, you know, in, the, in the late uh, 1950s. There was, uh, there is a, what well, was at one time, a coal mine being operated at the base of Mount Gibraltar. And there was a young boy who, or man who was working there and decided to uh, climb Gibraltar. And uh, fortunately he fell he, and they've never found him. Um, they did find uh, uh, a hope chest or something uh, that he had some clothing in. Um, and so but that's all they ever found. So um, it's a bit of a tragic event, but sort of the history of some of these mountains that we have here. So walking along this uh, road, you might come across these footprints in the mud. So this is a, a print of a, a black bear. So our feet are going to the right, the black bear is going to the left. So I, I, I must have gone there before, you know, before, certainly before we went by. But you can see the arch of the pad of his foot. It's, it's a nice arc. And there's really not much in terms of uh, toe marks or claw marks out in front. So this, to me anyways, is an indication that this is a, a black bear pad that uh, you're looking at sort of thing. So another thing we saw there was the, uh, the Western toad. And so it was uh, a nice little sighting. And so I was asking the ladies in my group if they were brave enough to kiss it to see if they could actually get their prints. But the prints, uh, none of them really wanted to do it, but I must, when we were walking back along the trail, these two uh, cowboys came riding by and the ladies whipped their heads around to look at who it was. 
and I think it was that Leonardo DiCaprio, the 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 um, actor. So I guess they maybe they got their prints after all. Come on, Froggy. <laughs> Let's change, there we go, sorry. Sometimes it takes a longer to change. Sorry, uh, along the um, edge of the trail under the spruce trees and pine trees, particularly pine trees, you have a good chance in the first week of June or so to see the Eclipse of Orchids, probably the prettiest flower that we have within our pine woods, certainly, uh, uh, certainly the prettiest of the, of the orchids. At the end of this little forestry road, there is the uh, bridge that goes across, which was destroyed to some degree of the flooding. Uh, but past that point, uh, you know, people will ride their bikes and that. But when we were there having lunch, we had the good fortune of seeing some uh, harlequin ducks. Floating down the river. So that's a, was a pretty nice sighting if you're looking for harlequin ducks. Uh, I would imagine this time of year, they might be setting up their little territories along some of the streams uh, and uh, maybe you have a chance of seeing them. Going further north, we run into the Moose Mountain area. So you, this is a, a pretty uh, great hike to go if you wanna get up in a real sort of alpine mountain environment without driving too far from Calgary, just west of Bragg Creek. Uh, toward the Elbow Falls, you can uh, drive up the Moose Mountain Access Road, so you can gain lots of elevation that way, and then you kind of walk up onto the slope to the to the left, that will run right up onto the high peak there, where the lookout is itself. So here's a view getting up into the Alpine along the old uh, Access Road uh, up into the uh, area. You can see there's kind of a hump ahead of you, which you think might be the summit, but actually it's not quite the summit. You still have to go a bit further. Um, some of you may know, uh, we had a movie filmed around Southern Alberta a little while back, and it was Brokeback Mountain. And you'll notice in the background behind this gentleman with the uh, tan coat is that same slope going up there. So they actually had some filming uh, on top of uh, uh, the Moose Mountain Meadows there. And I think they actually had some sheep there as well, but they, were, they had to collect up all the sheep droppings at the end of their filming to make sure they were gonna contaminate the area. Um, I had this idea actually of collecting a bunch of the rocks when I was up there and then selling them on eBay as official Brokeback Mountain rocks. Um, but I was, didn't quite get to doing that. Who knows? <laughs> there may be time still. So here we are up on that first big hump and then you've got to look a lot further up to see where the actual look is and kind of a sketchy little trail that takes you along the edge of the, uh, of the cliffs there and then up and around. But once you get up, you get a fabulous view. And here's the view that uh, you have, including the probably the highest outhouse in um, Alberta. Well, pretty, well, not quite maybe, but pretty close, at least, at least that's close to Calgary anyways. I guess there's a few other ones up in the big mountains. So um, quite the room with a view for sure up on top of, of Moose Mountain. So let's head over to the northern edge of uh, Kananaskis Valley. Here we have a photograph of Barrier Lake, a nice little pull off uh, off the highway and you get a beautiful view look down Kananaskis Valley. And right up the Barrier Lake, there's a hike you can go on uh, at the, I guess it would be the North End, which is called uh, Prairie View. And here we have a picture of Prairie View uh, lookout from the, from the lake. I was just up there uh, yesterday actually and we had a nice view looking across the lake to uh, Mount Baldy, the tall peak there. And you can actually, you know, certainly can, you can hike up Mount Baldy as well. It's, like, it's quite a climb to get up in there. Um, I almost got knocked off the mountain by a golden eagle because the eagle was flying along there and I was coming up from the backside and the eagle was coming up the front side and uh, we almost met uh, head to head because I could hear it fluffing around, flapping its wings. And I thought, what the heck is that? And it turned out to be a golden eagle. 
anyways, here's a view from the top of uh, Mount Baldy looking back down onto Barrier Lake. I actually took this picture around the January 5th one year, just happened to be uh, an area time when there wasn't hardly any snow. Uh, not, not much anyway so but an interesting view looking out onto Morley Flats and the rising uh, mountains to the to the left there so uh, if you got lots of energy and all that and don't mind a little scrambling um, Baldy Mountain certainly is a is a challenge but a rewarding one um, for sure this is just down the valley a little ways this is a Nakiska ski area and then you we have the trail that all goes up to to Mount Allen so you can hike uh, from Ribbon Creek up along the slopes here, across the top of Common, or I think it's uh, Olympic Summit, to past the Rock Garden and up onto uh, Mount Allen itself. It's quite a climb. I think it's 4,000 feet elevation gain the road routes. It's, it's quite a go to get up there, but you get great, great views. So here's a view um, looking past the mine scar where they used to have coal mining. And you can go all the way up this ridge. You're basically following this ridge line up across the cliff band, up onto the Olympic Summit. And then you just follow that along. So here's a view looking somewhat close to the uh, summit of Mount Allen. Uh, you're, so you come up this ridge, you walk along past the rock garden here, and then all the way up on top. And as you may know, it can be extremely windy up there, uh, particularly when the Chinook winds are blowing. Uh, they record winds of probably 180 kilometers an hour. It would knock you off your feet. But, you know, you kind of... <laughs> I think in the summertime, it's not quite so bad. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a neat climb to get up to for sure. Going down Valley, there's a variety of different hikes on the Canassus Valley. There's Lillian Lake and Galatea Lakes. There's a range of different ridges on the east side of Canascus um, that you can go up to. Uh, there's Limestone Mountain across from Galatea Creek. Uh, there's the Opal Loop that people do. There's Kent, Kent Creek Ridge. Uh, sorry, King Creek Ridge, which is a great hike to get up into as well. But this is a view I took from the top of uh, Gap Mountain, looking across to uh, upper and lower Canastas Lake. And certainly there's lots of nice hiking in that area as well. So here we have a view of the uh, upper Canastas Lake, and you can hike all the way around the lake. It's about 16 kilometers, or you can just do one corner or the other corner, or you can head up uh, into the Astor Lake area up in here off to the left far back there, or you go up to the right of Mount Lyotli, which is the big mountain in the middle, and you can get up into uh, uh, South Kananaskis Pass and then uh, get up toward uh, North Kananaskis Pass and area. So lots of scope for exploration for sure. Uh, here's a map of uh, Rawson Lake area. So you can go up from Upper Kananaskis Lake and then head off from the lake up into Rawson Lake. So um, right now they got a certainly really good trail. When I first went on that, I actually, <laughs> I misread the description and I ended up going up Sorrel Creek instead. <laughs> nice spot to go, but there was no lake. But I managed to climb up onto the high ridge between Sorrel Creek and Rawson. And it gave me a nice view looking down onto, uh, onto uh, Rawson Lake. Uh, lots of people go there. It's probably one of the most well-used trails within Kananaskis country. Uh, probably upwards of two to 3,000 people go there a month in the summertime. Um, so it's, it's a hugely popular. And this is the nice view from the outlet. So you can understand how pretty it is when you get up there, uh, up to Ross and Lake. If you walk around the lake uh, and then head up past Hidden Lake, and up a real kind of a scrambly, somewhat uh, sleepy trail that takes you up to Astor Lake, which to me is one of the neat places to get to. Uh, it's, for me, it's a backpack trip. I know people certainly do it in a day, um, but I tend to like to, to backpack uh, up in that area and then spend a couple of days exploring, particularly climbing up onto the North Over Ridge, which is to the right of that mountain in the background. Um, Waking, I think it's Wakey Nambi is this uh, mountain in the middle, the hand of God. And you can hike up and then go up onto the uh, mountain off to your right, north over Ridge. Um, fabulous spot when you get up there, for sure. Um, but you kind of have to work at it. The other area to go to is North Kananaskis Pass and Turbine Canyon. So this is a view from the campground area. The cabin just, uh, or the stream is dives down into this big canyon. 
called Turbine Canyon. So you can walk along the edge here and see how deep the canyon gets very quickly. Watch you don't knock your friend over. And you get to the edge here and you look way, way, way down to where the, uh, the creek is in a very short, short distance. It's carved down probably 300 feet through the limestone. So it's, it is a, quite the place to, uh, <laughs> to hang out at uh, North Kananaskis Pass and the uh, Turbine Canyon Campground. But lots of wildflowers there if you get there at the right time of year. So here we have uh, just a beautiful meadow of arnica and flea banes and uh, valerian and paintbrushes. And yeah, it's, it was great around the first week of August if you can get up there. It's quite a long distance to get in there. Pretty well, again, that's a backpacking trip. Although again, people now are into trail running and they'll run up there and back in a day, which uh, <laughs> good for them. Anyways, uh, just a little down road from Kananaskis Lakes turnoff is the uh, access to Elbow Lake. So if you're looking for a short little hike, with some really nice uh, lake and views, you can hike up to uh, Elbow Lake. I think it's about a kilometer and a half to get up from the from the highway parking lot. It's quite steep initially, but um, it, it well worth your your while. And you can walk around the end of the lake and off into the alpine meadows in behind. Uh, you can camp at Elbow Lake as well. So if you're interested in getting a sense of what backcountry camping is like, but be somewhere close to your car. Uh, I'd recommend uh, going to Elbow Lake and give that a, a shot as well. A little out of focus, I apologize, but this is one of the popular hikes in uh, the southern part of Pialahi Provincial Park, which is Tarmigan Cirque. So you, you park your car, you walk across the road up into the basin and beyond, and it makes a nice little loop. And it's kind of an interpretive little trail too. Um, you can. Uh, you can I think download a brochure off of the Canasta Country website and get a sense of what you're looking at as you're walking up into the, the meadows. One of the first things you come across, which is really nice to see, are the glacier lilies. You get lots of them just up into the open meadows um, around, say, probably, I don't know what, the first two week of June, or sorry, week of July, something in that range. Well, the road doesn't open until June 15th, and you got to give time for all that snow to melt. So I think around the first week of, of July or something, you can go up there and, and see the nice uh, the glacier lilies. And because it's named Ptarmigan Cirque, you hope to see a ptarmigan. Well, here's a little baby ptarmigan running across the meadow. I kind of scared it when I came around the corner, and so it was running away. And where do little baby ptarmigans like to run to? Well, they love to run to mom. <laughs> so here we have the little guy hiding under the breast feathers of the mother, um, getting a little, uh, you know, courage at some point to actually look back to see who scared it. And here it is, giving me a little stare. <laughs> Why did you scare me like that? <laughs> Give me like the evil eye. So I don't know if you ever had the evil eye from a baby ptarmigan, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> Anyways, across the road from ptarmigan Cirque is Pocatera Cirque. There's really no... Uh, it's not a designated trail, but certainly lots of people go in there. And as you can see, it's chocker block full of larches, um, as what as Tarmigan Cirque is as well in the fall. Um, so um, because of that, it, it gets extremely busy in the autumn time, in the last week of September, middle of September or so. And um, I happened to be driving through Highwood Pass when this was going on. And I've got a little video to show you what the park managers are trying to deal with now. So this is coming past the parking lots of, and you can continue on, continuing on. Cars on either side of the highway. I counted all these cars. There was 250 cars parked on the road and lots of spaces between them. So you know there was a lot more that were there before I got that coming back through there. So here's the trailhead right here. And it just continues on, continues on, continues on. So that's what they are dealing with now. Um, unfortunately, well, it's nice to see people getting out there, but I think maybe we're, I don't know what to do with say. It's, it's just uh, getting kind of crazy. Another place that gets very busy in the fall, uh, or in, uh, any time of the year, really, uh, but well, certainly in the fall and summer, is uh, Chester Lake up the Smith Dorian Highway. Again, it's a large country. You can see the larches up in the background there on Mount Burstall. 
And here's a picture at Chester Lake itself. So some of the larches that you can see um, in the background on the right in the distance is the backside of Fortress Mountain. For those who might know Fortress Mountain, uh, that's the backside. You can actually hike up to the summit of Fortress Mountain, kind of a scrambly little thing, but you can do that. Or you can go to the left through the trees up onto the ridge, just to the upper left here and get a nice view um, from three, I think it's called Three Lakes Valley. So going up through that area is the uh, elephant rocks. So here's a picture of the elephant rocks uh, that you might come by and they're all big boulders of limestone. And the limestones, when you're looking at them, you might be lucky to see fossils. So here's the uh, cross section of a coral, um, a horn coral uh, fossil that I saw in the rocks, you can get that. You can also get uh, brachiopods. So here's a little brachiopod that probably lived somewhere around 300 and some odd million years ago, but is preserved as a fossil in, in the rock in, in that area. And here's a little clustering of horn coral um, fossils as well. So keep your eyes out when you're walking through those areas looking for these fossils. And it's just amazing to think that these guys were out there bathing in a nice warm ocean uh, 300 and some odd million years ago. Getting up on top of that little ridge, you can look down onto Chester Lake and beyond. I took this photograph on September 13th, 2001, two days after the uh, World Trade Towers came down. In fact, that's how I found out about the towers. I was talking to a person on the phone talking about the hike. And she said, well, you, you sound pretty chipper today. And I said, yeah, we've got a nice hike coming up. He said, well, have you heard about the towers? And I said, what towers? He said, the, the towers. And I said, Calgary Tower? Oh, no, no, the, the, the World Trade Towers. I said, well, what's going on? She said, turn on your TV. And I found out what was going on. And so when we were up here two days later, uh, a person in my group said, thank God there are still beautiful places in the world. And I think that's what the mountains provide for us, is that thank God there's beautiful places in the world. Across the road from Chester Lake is Burstall Pass, a nice view looking down toward where you started your hike. And then you can get up to a nice viewpoint where you can see the, uh, uh, I guess the south end of Banff Park, looking over to Lehman Lake and up into the mountains in BC. Again, uh, another nice place to go. Um, about eight some odd kilometers to get out there and you kind of sometimes have to wade across the water that comes down from the Robertson Glacier, but certainly worthwhile uh, a hike for sure. A little bit further north of uh, Chester Lake and Burstall Pass is Tent Ridge. So here we have a view uh, up on Tent Ridge, um, becoming extremely popular. It's probably one of the well-known tent uh, ridge walks now within Kananaskis and certainly in this particular area. Nice view looking down onto Spray Lakes uh, and that sort of area. But when we were on this hike, before we you know were able to get going on it, um, we had to watch out for these guys. Just at the start of the trail, we had a little uh, delay as we let the mooses do what mooses do. <laughs> they hung out for a bit and they drifted off into the woods, so we were able to continue on on our hike. So it was kind of fun to see. Getting out toward uh, Banff a little bit more, we got uh, the one hike is certainly Mount Yamneska. And I think that area is closed right now. They've been doing some trail work and they're quite concerned about the people trampling around on the trails before they dry out. So it has been closed for a while, but you can climb up to your right, to the right of the cliffs there. And you get this view looking off toward the, the edge of, uh, of Mount Yamnaska. You can get up onto that ridge. You go through a little, uh, kind of like a little canyon choke rock thing on the backside of, of the, uh, Mount Yamnaska, and you get to see the backside. You got this nice trail that wanders along. I think the summit is just up over here. But before you get to the summit, you have to negotiate a little bit of a, a ledge. And here's the ledge, <laughs> this along here. Uh, when I first did that, uh, there was no chain, so you had to be somewhat careful. <laughs> but um, there's a chain there now that people, you can hold on to, and that gives you a little bit more confidence as you go around that particular little spot. Um, lots of people go there, um, so it's definitely uh, something that uh, people like to do, despite this little uh, ledgy thing. 
looking down from the top, of course, you get a great view into Bull Valley, Bull Valley Park, uh, looking into uh, Barrier Mountain in distance and the Kananaskis area. So uh, well worth the effort if you can get up there, but you definitely have to be careful and certainly wear the appropriate clothing. Uh, you know, I've seen people going up there in little running shoes and uh, uh, shorts and, and, and nothing really other than that. So uh, I'd recommend you, you know, gear up appropriately. Anyways, just a little bit further up the road on the 1A highway is Grotto Canyon, a nice little place to go to. And on the right, you can see the, uh, the pictographs that they have within the canyon. Um, so it's definitely something to look to, to see. Um, perhaps they were, were Hopi, Hopi Indians that uh, made those uh, particular drawings because there's a little uh, drawing in there, Copapella which is a flute player, which is characteristic of uh, Western states, uh, southern, Southwestern states. So it's possible that uh, that had that influence when they, when, they, when they put in those drawings. So keep an eye out for those. So let's go to Mount Assiniboine. Uh, there are different backcountry lodges that you're able to see. And this is the uh, lodge of Mount Assiniboine. It's about a, a 28, 30 kilometers walk to get in there. Uh, but most, a lot of people now, they helicopter in. Uh, in that area, you can stay at the lodge. There is the Nayset cabins, which the lodge runs, as well as there's also the backcountry campsite. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, I know people are running in there and, and back out in a day, um, but why bother do that when you can actually stay at a, at a nice lodge and, and have this fabulous view from the, your cabin, looking out toward uh, fabulous uh, Mount Assiniboine and, and Lake Magog. Uh, fabulous place to go for sure. One of my favorite hikes in that area is going up to the Nublet and the Nub. So here we are climbing up uh, the Nublet area, looking down on Cerulean Lake with uh, Sunburst Lake just peeking out in, on the left there. Fabulous spot to sit and ponder your navel if you're uh, if so inclined. You can get a little higher up there and you can see these nice alpine uh, sank foils scattering across the, uh, the upper scree slopes. And here's a scree slope up to the summit of of the nub i think it's just over nine thousand feet and here we are up on the summit of the nub uh, the fellow on the right was extremely excited that this is this is his first summit on a mountain he really was excited about it but he was a little concerned because how could he explain to his friends that he actually summited the nub <laughs> doesn't have quite the pizzazz as as a cinnaboyne but uh, definitely still worthwhile for sure great very great spot to go if you can get in there Sunshine Meadows is a great spot. You can take the gondola and then the standees chair up along the Alpine Meadows. And this will take you up to a very uh, a, a beautiful viewpoint, looking down onto uh, Rock Isle Lake um, on your left, uh, Larrick's Lake in the background, and Grizzly Lake would be just off to the side. Great loop to walk through. Beautiful in the uh, summer for flowers. And of course, in the fall, it's great for larches as well. You can actually go off into the meadows beyond Rock Isle Lake. There's a trail that will take you up over to uh, Howard Douglas Lake. And actually, it's the trail that takes you to Assiniboine. And if you have a little bit of exploration in your, um, in your heart, you can go up onto the what looks like a saddle ridge there of the two summits. That's Quartz Ridge. You can certainly you know, you can walk up on there and, and get some great views as well. So I certainly recommend it if you're looking for some place to go. Um, maybe a little bit less busy than some of the other areas because you have to have the gondola and that sort of thing. Lots of flowers up there as well. You know, certainly just meadows of flowers. Uh, paint brushes for sure are always an attraction. It's just too bad we can't grow those in our garden, but they, they're kind of a, 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 pest, a parasite of other plants around it. So they don't, uh, they don't transplant at all. So, and certainly don't try <laughs> for sure. Just enjoy them as they are. Here's a spot along the meadows that was all dug up by Mr. Grizzly Bear going after glacier lily bulbs. So here's a big hunk of sod with the glacier lily leaves sticking out of the top. Um, and so you, that's why grizzly bears have that great big hump on their back and those great big claws. They're, they're a digging animal. And here we have the, uh, the business end of a grizzly bear, the big claws and the big feet. And you can see again, um, oh, you can see this, my little cursor here. So this is the arc in behind the toes. And remember the black, bear, it has an, arc, an actual arc to it. 
whereas this is nice and straight on a grizzly bear. So that might give you a, a sense of what a grizzly bear pod looks like. Now, you have to be a professional naturalist to get this close to a grizzly bear, uh, such as I am. Um, if you're not um, fully trained, it can be quite dangerous to get this close. So I recommend you don't do that. Um, actually, I took this picture at the Calgary Zoo. So there's a nice bit of plexiglass between me and the paw. <laughs> Anyways. Um, down the Highway 93, one of the favorite hikes in the area is the Stanley Glacier. Nice hike up into this basin and up onto a viewpoint where you can get a look at the glacier and the big waterfalls in the area. So this is a little bit of a view. You can hike right up onto that, uh, uh, what do you call plateau there with the rocks. You get a nice view in there. You can circle around to a nice big waterfall and then drop down back to the main trail. When you're having lunch there, you have to watch out though, because there's these little critters, the um, golden mantle ground squirrels, which might sneak up behind you and make an effort to uh, relieve you of one of your pieces of sandwiches. So keep an eye out for those when you're sitting around. But as you're up in this area too, you want to keep an eye out for fossils. Uh, the Burgess Shale, you're probably all quite familiar with, but there's other little areas that have the same assemblage of fossils. And Stanley Glacier, there's a bed of rock um, that they discovered, which is the same. Um, and so you have these, uh, these are trilobites that lived somewhere around 550 million years ago. And you can actually book a guided hike from Parks Canada to be taken up to the uh, Stanley Glacier area and look for uh, these trilobites. And they, they can tell you stories about them and show pictures and everything like that. So I highly recommend that if you have the uh, opportunity to, uh, to get out that way is to book a hike up into Stanley Glacier with an interpreter and, uh, and learn about the really neat fossils that are there. Um, across the Castle Junction from the Highway 93 going down south is the uh, um, Johnson's Canyon area. So some of you, lots of you I'm sure have been there. Uh, I was there, this is a picture I took one, one winter when I was kind of hiking around through the area. Uh, we actually, Nature Calgary actually did have a speaker talk about the black swifts, which are uh, nest, which nest in there, and the numbers are increasing a little bit over the next last couple of years. That's a good sign. Uh, I should say I just learned that uh, these railings and stuff, a lot of them will be replaced. I think starting around mid-August or something like that. So part of the Johnson's Canyon um, parking lot will be. Uh, closed off because they where they have their uh, construction equipment or, or uh, machines and stuff like that. So just be aware of that. You might want to go onto Parks Canada website and check up what's going on with uh, Johnson's Canyon, certainly uh, later in the summer there. Going up above the uh, canyon, you can get to uh, the ink pots. So it's a really neat place. You can see the water bubbling up from below. So you can be there in the wintertime. Um, I hiked up there this winter, or you can uh, certainly go there in the summertime as well. So it's a good place to visit when you're in that area. So that brings us up to, uh, to Lake Louise. Um, I'm sure a lot of you would agree that Lake Louise is a premier area to go exploring and hiking. Uh, it always takes my breath away when I stand on the shore of Lake Louise, even though there may be hundreds or thousands of people around clamoring for a photograph. Um, I just put my blinders on and and relish the view um, at Lake Louise. Lots of good hikes in the area. You can hike around the lake up to the Plain of Six Glaciers. Here we are going around the lake um, with Mount Lefroy in the background. You continue on past the end of the lake and up into the rocky areas. Uh, here we have looking back onto uh, Lake Louise. We have this big cloud deck that we walked through, um, which was kind of fun to do. And you turn around and you get this fabulous view of Mount Lefroy, uh, Mount Victoria on the right, and the Victoria Glacier. And you can see the Victoria Glacier has melted back tremendously over the last um, many decades. So get it while you're there, because the way things are going, who knows how long that glacier is going to be sitting there to, for us to look at. So uh, you continue on up and eventually get to the tea house, a little bit out of focus. Again, a slide that I, I scanned. And great little spot to sit and um, you know pay a few bucks for a, a tea and a scone or, or two. Uh, definitely a nice, nice little way to spend a bit of an afternoon. But if you got a little extra energy, maybe you, you had that scone and you think, you know, I, I'm, I'm able, I'm good now. I can keep, keep on going. You can go up on one of my favorite hikes is Pope Prospect. So above the tea house, uh, you go past the tea house a little ways, you turn right and you amble up through a kind of a faint trail. There is a trail there, but it's somewhat faint. 
and you get up onto a plateau which gives you a fabulous view of uh, Mont Lefroy, Victoria, the Death Trap. And if you look in the, above that little at the Death Trap area, there's a little bump there. And that little bump is Abbott's um, hut, built there in 1922. And uh, so it's an interesting place to look at. And I, I was up there once a few years back from the Lake O'Hara side. And here, so here we have Abbott's hut. And some of you may know now that uh, that hut is going to be demolished in June by Parks Canada because of climate change, warming, um, et cetera. The right hand side of the hut, as we're looking at it, the supporting area has uh, collapsed and the uh, hut is in danger of, of completely collapsing. So for safety issues, et cetera, uh, Parks Canada decided that they were actually going to dismantle the hut. So unfortunately, uh, we won't have an opportunity to scramble up to get to Abbott's hut uh, anymore. Anyways, Lake Louise, not only there's plenty of such glaciers, there's Lake Agnes, uh, kind of a steady, steep little climb, maybe what, four kilometers or so to get up to Lake Agnes, another good spot for a tea. And then you can walk around to the back of the lake and then swing up on the left where you have the larches in the sun and that takes you up onto the big beehive. And so here we are up on top of the big beehive looking down at Lake Louise. And from there you can actually um, get a beautiful view of the Bow Valley. And I went up there uh, a few years back, I was hiking with a little group. And this fellow here, Russ Croft, always said he was going to bring up ice cream for us. <laughs> even though it might be a hot day, he figured it out that we could have ice cream. So he managed to figure out a system and brought up um, these little bowls and we all had ice cream on top of the big beehive. So it was a, a pretty good thing that Russ was able to figure out. So that was very enjoyable. Across from Lake Agnes Tea House, um, you have Mount Fairview, which is a fabulous mountain with its golden necklace of larches. You can hike around the back side of that and get up onto the top. Here's, here we are up on the top. Uh, I apologize, a little, a little blurry, but you can get a fabulous view of Victoria, Lefroy, and um, all those different peaks in there looking down. And I was standing up here um, looking around, and there was a guy standing behind, beside me, and he said, what a fabulous view. And I said, yeah, we're privileged to be here. He said, so I asked him where he came from. And he said, well, I'm from uh, uh, California. He, he asked me where I came from. And I said, well, I'm from... Um, I, I am from Calgary. He said, you don't know how lucky you are. Here you are standing in this fabulous location and you can go home for supper. And he had to spend all his vacation money traveling and on and on and on to get to that same spot. So it's very nice sometimes to see the world through some people's other eyes and to realize what we have here at home, the beauty of our Canadian Rockies. This is looking down onto Lake Louise. You can see the rock flower that the Victoria Glacier is grinding up coming into the lake and, and giving the lake its uh, kind of milky uh, green color. Moraine Lake, of course, is very fabulous as a, as a place to go hiking as well. Um, and so one of my favorite hikes from Moraine Lake is to go to Eiffel Lake. So you, you start on the same trail as Large Valley, but you just keep on going and you get to Eiffel Lake which is a really nice spot to linger around for a while. You can hike further up, of course, up to Wenchem the Pass, if you like. Um, but you can certainly get a nice view here at uh, Eiffel Lake. And just above uh, Eiffel Lake, the one day we were there, there was a, a grizzly bear and a, and a, a cub uh, grazing around in, in the meadow. So um, as Henry David Thoreau would say, uh, it's nice to see uh, wildlife pasturing freely where we may never wander. A large valley, of course, is a beautiful place to go in the fall. Uh, thus, it's extremely busy, as you may know. Uh, this is a picture of the larches with uh, the Valley of the Ten Peaks in behind. You can continue on through Large Valley up to Sentinel Pass, which is in the background there. A zigzagging trail will take you up uh, to uh, the beginnings of, if you're a real scrambler, up to Mount Temple to the right. Or you can pop down the other side into Paradise Valley. But here's a view looking from just the big uh, Sentinel Pass down onto Large Valley onto the Valley of the Ten Peaks. So as you know now, over the last few years in particular, it's become extremely busy to get to these places. People were arriving at Moraine Lake at five o'clock in the morning in, with the hope of getting a parking spot. 
Um, so now, uh, you know, of course, they have the shuttle service now, and uh, you can get your shuttle bus. Right now, I guess now it's going to be from the Lake Louise ski area parking lot, and you can get your shuttle bus to go into Moraine Lake and Lake Louise. Uh, you can go online to uh, onto Banff and, uh, and book your uh, spot on the shuttle bus. So I'd recommend doing that uh, unless you want to try to get out to Moraine Lake at three in the morning. Okay. Um, Skokie Lodge, just on the other side of the valley from Lake Louise, is a, is a nice a favorite spot to go to. You can take, if you're a guest of the lodge, you get a nice van ride up for a little ways. And then you start hiking and uh, keep your eyes peeled because you never know what might be around the corner. <laughs> um, up through Tarmbergen uh, Lake and up on Deception Pass, a bit of a grind getting up Deception Pass, but eventually you'll get to the other side and drop down to um, historical uh, Skokie Lodge. A neat little place to go way off there in the, in the back country. It's a, it's a great spot to go. Of course, they have lots of good food, so that's always a reward of doing some of these hikes into these backcountry lodges. And not only do us commoners get a chance to go there, but we have uh, the signatures. Here's Will and Kate. You know, remember, you might know that they, back in 2011, they visited Canada and they stayed at, uh, at Skokie Lodge. And so they were, uh, Neat place, neat people to have there, and they really enjoyed their their uh, stay there as well. You go from uh, Skokie Lodge and climb up to Merlin Lake and up to the Dragon's Drink, and see Merlin's Castle in the background. So it's kind of a nice little day hike up from from Skokie Lodge for sure. And then from there, hiking out, you can hike over to uh, Packers Pass as a, and then climb up from there, and it takes you by this nice creek, and then you have to get up past that waterfall in the distance to Myosis Lake, and then from there is a Zigadensis Lake, and then up over Packers Pass. And to get past that waterfall, you have to go through a little, um, I guess a little tunnel in the rocks to get up um, above the waterfall there. So a little exploration for sure. But you get a nice view of Myosotis Lake, which is a scientific name for um, forget-me-nots. And then from there you go around up into that base and beyond, which is Zigadensis Lake, which is a scientific name for white camas. From there up onto uh, Packers Pass with a beautiful view looking down onto Ptarmigan Lake and with Mount Temple in the background and, uh, and part of the uh, Mount um, Hungabee in the, in the far distance there. Uh, you can hike up to Redoubt on the left side of Redoubt Mountain, which is the big one in the foreground here. There's a nice lake in there called uh, Redoubt Lake. So lots of places to explore in there. Um, you can hike up to Tarmigan Lake for the day. You just have to put in some time going up the access road to Temple Day Lodge. Uh, going into Yoho Park, we have, of course, Takakal Falls, which is a signature place to go to. And uh, one of the places to go to when you're hiking in that area is up to Twin Falls. And here we have Fran Drummond uh, waving us goodbye as we were heading out from staying there for a couple of days. And some of you may know now that Fran no longer um, is the proprietor for Twin Falls. She had been there for, I don't know, like decades, decades upon decades, um, but she's no longer there. And I believe the Alpine Club of Canada has taken it over and will be opening it up, at least initially as a, as a stopover for lunch and, and perhaps later on, it, as an overnight place. So, but right next to it, of course, is the famous uh, Twin Falls, which sometimes the fall on the left is not flowing that much, but uh, it's a neat place to go for sure. The other place, of course, is a famous trail in a sense is the Ice Line Trail. You can hike up from Twin Falls up onto this high plateau and then go all the way back around and drop down to Takakal Falls. It's a fabulous spot if you got good weather, right next up to the Emerald Glacier on the right. And there's great views of the surrounding peaks and uh, it's quite a long haul. I forget exactly the distance now, maybe what, 20 kilometers round trip if you do the whole thing. It's, uh, but it's, uh, it's a great time up there if you, have, uh, if you have good weather. So last place I'm gonna take you to this evening is uh, Lake O'Hara. I've had the opportunity of going there a, on a few occasions. I take people there to the lodge in the, in the, in the fall for the large trees. Um, so uh, I hope you can get up there at some point in time. 
And there's different ways of getting there. You can certainly become a, a lodge uh, guest and, and they have their own bus, but most people will take the uh, Parks Canada bus that takes you up there uh, for a day trip. And here we have people loading up their gear. You can, uh, some of them are camping, so they'll take the bus to go up to the campground as well. Very hard to get on. Uh, right, right now, what Parks Canada does is sometime, I think it's a month between March and a end of April or something like that, where you put a request in. You can request up to six dates and you put that in and then you hope that you're you're picked. And I know one time there they were doing it, they had 17,000 requests for about 3,400 spots. So I've put in twice now and I've, I have not gotten a spot. Some people get lucky, they get two spots. But, so um, you can walk the road up, it's 11 kilometers. So it's a bit of a goal, maybe two and a half, three hours to get up there, but you certainly can do that as well. And if you're lucky, you can catch the bus going down at the end of the day, pay about 10 bucks. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, but um, this one time I was going up there on the bus and we happened to have this little guy right beside us. So black bear feeding on uh, buffalo berries. So they do get the bears in the area for sure. Uh, one time we were coming back down from Lake O'Hara and this bear ran across the road in front of us, followed by three cubs, three little guys, and they all of a sudden they ran up a tree. And of course, everybody goes to the other side of the bus so they can get a picture. <laughs> the bus started to lean somewhat dangerously toward where the bear was. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, they're out there for sure. Here you have uh, the dock at Lake O'Hara. If you're at the, a lodge guest, you can get one of the boats or canoes and go canoeing out onto the lake. Looking back, we're on the back side of, of uh, Mount Victoria, you know, the back side of Lake Louise. So this is kind of where you are. You can hike up into that basin there called Lake Louisa. Off to your right where the larches are is the Opaben Plateau. And you go to MacArthur Lake. Here's a picture, I think, or a little video hiking to MacArthur Lake. Well, oh, sorry, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> the bears are friendly up there, although I've never seen one myself, but this is a picture I. I took of a, a stuffed bear just to make sure that uh, I knew what they looked like. <laughs> Anyways, um, so here's the lodge itself. Uh, it has uh, room for 20 or for uh, 16 people in the lodge and there, there's 11 cabins that you can stay at, uh, somewhat expensive. The lodge now is charging somewhere around $780 a night for a room in the lodge. And the cabins are running somewhere around $1,100 a night. If you want to go a little uh, less expensive, there is the Elizabeth Parker Hut, which you can book through the Alpine Club. And it's kind of communal living there. Or you can, if you're lucky, you can book through Parks Canada is the campground. Really nice campground. There's about 30 tent sites. They've got two kitchen shelters, storage area for your uh, gear and your food. Um, very, very nice campground for sure. Po uh, portable water or, or potable water. They've got washrooms and all that sort of stuff. So definitely a, a worthwhile if you, um, if you can get a spot. Right now, I think they're all full, but you can keep looking on their reservation sites for Park Canada, see if something opens up. So anyways, this is a hike going down to MacArthur Lake. The blue of that lake will just astound you uh, when you're hiking in there. It's unbelievable, that blue. Of course, with the larches as well, it's well set off. Another place I like to go to is the Opaben Plateau. So we're just hiking up past Mary Lake, heading up uh, into the Opaben Plateau. And here we are at the top and getting into the plateau itself with this nice little creek flowing through Mount Hungabee in the background and Wee Waxy Gap in the background. There's a trail actually goes up onto Wee Waxy Gap and then goes across the Huber ledges down to Lake Louisa. So there's a, what they call an alpine route you can go on to. Here's a um, little baby dipper being fed by uh, Mrs. Mrs. Dipper on that little creek. So I got lucky kind of there. And, and here's another little cre creature that was out feeding in the meadows. Probably the prettiest or the cutest little guy out there in the in the mountains is the uh, the pika. I guess some people call them pika, pika pika. Um, I think pika might. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, look at it f filling its mouth. And just when you think it's fall full, it'll go for more. <laughs> and then it runs off into the the boulder field. So kind of cute little guys up there. You got to watch out though. There's a possibility that they'll be chased around by a short-tailed weasel. 
um, for sure. That's one of their you know, enemies up in that area. Another creature that you're going to see up there, of course, or in the area is the marmot. Lots of marmots up in the Lake O'Hara area. And I think they've got the best job in the world. They sleep about nine months of the year and then snooze for three. I don't think I see them doing much of anything, but uh, they do out there. But they have to be a little uh, wary themselves because they have to wear it, look about for wolverine. I confess, this is not my picture. It's a friend of mine's, uh, Ian Jones. Um, I was lucky. I did see a wolverine uh, a couple of years ago. At, uh, at Lake O'Hara, but I, I didn't get my camera out in time to get a good picture of it. So there are one or two that hang around there and uh, very um, uh, unlikely to see wolverines in the mountains, but this is one spot where you might have a chance. Of course, the Opaven Plateau, um, I don't know of any other area where you can get up and really, really soak up the larches uh, in the fall. Just beautiful. These, this is Hungab Hung Hungabili Lake, Hungabi Lake with the reflections of the of the larches. Um, just a beautiful spot. Yeah, Mount Hungabi in the background there, going up toward Opaven Lake. This is a view looking back down onto the lake as you're climbing a little bit higher up, looking at the mountains in the background, uh, Cathedral Mountain, uh, Mount Stephen in the left there with the glaciers and all. Um, so just a fabulous spot in the fall, boy, I tell you. Or even the spring uh, when the larches are all nice and green, um, it's a great spot to be as well. Here's the Opaben Lake with the Opaben Glacier in the background, Opaben Pass. You can actually hike from Moraine Lake up through Benchemna Pass, up through Opaben Pass, um, down across the glacier and, and back into Lake O'Hara. Uh, I think some of the outdoor um, schools like uh, Mount Yamneska runs uh, guided trips uh, doing that. So if you're looking for a venture, that could be something to, to look into. Um, this is a view from uh, the Grand, Ordre Grand View looking down onto Lake O'Hara. And we have the, in the, disc, in the background there, you can just see a bit of blue there. That is the uh, uh, Lake Oisa. And so you can hike up to there. And here we have hiking up uh, from Moraine Lake itself, or sorry, from Lake O'Hara itself. You do a bit of climbing to get up there, but uh, eventually you get to Lake Oisa. And Oisa, it means ice. And it often is frozen well into the middle of July. They have been doing some research up there. I was up there a couple of years ago and there were some scientists from UFC that were doing research on the lake and the transmissibility of light down into the lake column. Um, so that, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing that they were doing there. And sometimes you get lucky, you might see an avalanche coming off of Glacier Peak and behind. So it's, it's a good place to go, uh, to sit and watch the world go by. And not only are you out watching the world there, but there's also mountain goats. Uh, I came across this little uh, mother and, and uh, uh, kid um, up on uh, overlooking Opaven Plateau. So um, there is life um, out there and hopefully you can provide some of that enjoyment uh, when you get up there and see those see that wildlife. So I'll just close off my uh, my program here. I'll stop sharing. And um, I guess that's the end of our uh, my little talk. If you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I see, I'll just read them off here. Did you see Swifts at Crip Lake? Um, no, I, I've never seen the Swifts at Crip Lake. I think there's Swifts that you'll get around the um, Prince of Wales Hotel down there. I don't know if that's the spot where, uh, where people will see them. Um, but I, I have not uh, seen Swifts myself in, uh, in that area. Uh, let's see. Um, is it being shared? Okay. Uh, let's see where we are here. Do you? See, yeah. Okay. Um, Kristen says on the news today they said Mount Yamnaska is open. So that's uh, that's good to know because uh, I was hoping to go there to Yamnaska Natural Area. Just down below um, Yamnaska uh, Mountain itself, there's a Yamnaska Natural Area, which is quite a way, nice place to explore uh, if you're looking for um, a little adventure that's not too far from Calgary. Uh, there's no set trail as such, but you can wander around a little bit there and, and, and find, your, find your way around as well. So um, yeah, yeah, so you can keep an eye out for that as well. 
Okay. So I do hope you all get a chance to uh, to get out hiking. It's that time of year. The low the low altitude areas um, are um, are available now. Um, the snow still up as high. Um, Elizabeth writes, "Will mountains stay so crowded?" Yeah, good question, Elizabeth. Um, I guess some thought was is that with COVID that there wasn't too many other places for people to go, and they were starting to look more local to to explore, but. I'm not sure on that. Um, like I say, I went to um, uh, Barrier Look, Barrier Lake, and Prairie View Lookout on uh, on Sunday, and we got there a little bit early, which wasn't too bad. But it was still really busy. The parking lot was really full. So I don't know. That's a good question. I th I think with the social media, um, people are really kind of cluing in on getting out there and maybe getting their photograph in front of a mountain and sharing it with their friends, which encourages the other friends to go out there. Um, I don't maybe people are getting more interested in, in, in uh, forest bathing, getting out into nature a bit more and enjoying what the, the benefits that they offer. That's a possibility as well. Um, uh, who knows, we'll see as we get into uh, more into the summer hiking season. But I'm kind of scared, and I shouldn't say scared. I, I guess we should enjoy the fact that people are getting out there and appreciating what we have. But I guess if you're kind of an old time hiker like I am, I'm I'm not super old, hopefully. <laughs> but you know, you used to be able to go out there and 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 have uh, you know a trail that was yeah, you meet one or two people and stuff like that, which was okay. Um, but now it's almost you know you, you just can't even get a parking spot. You go out to some of these trails that you used to think were, were pretty nice. So. Um, I don't know what to say on that. Um, who knows? But we're hoping that uh, people will uh, appreciate the trails and don't over, you know, run them. I mean, there's damage that occurs with those people. But, anyways, um, we'll, we'll see, I guess, this summer how it comes and people will spread out and hopefully we'll uh, be able to uh, enjoy the areas with um, and still have uh, some sense of, of wildness. When they when they go out into the into the hills, so okay. Can I leave it? Yeah. 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 Lake O'Hara is uh, is certainly well worth going to. I uh, just have to get your name in there. I think for the lodge, if you want to go to the lodge, is to um, put your name in now and to say that you're available at any time. And if a space opens up, they'll give you a phone call and you'll get a chance to get in there. Otherwise, you just um, put your name in for next year and, um, and give them a range of dates. Like the more availability you have, the more likely you're going to get a, a spot at Lake O'Hara. If you're very specific, you want to go on this particular week, uh, the chances are pretty small. But you want, you know, so give them lots of variety. Just say, I'm available from July 1st to September 30th and you might get a you might get a cancellation or something like that and, and you'll, you'll be able to get into the lodge and i think the elizabeth parker hut again is some sort of a, a lotto system in the summertime for, through alpine the alpine club so um anyways um yeah oh well um you know i'm sure we'll have a chance to uh to enjoy these areas this summer so i hope you guys have a chance to get out there in that so um, I think with that, um, I would like again to thank you all for attending our speaker series for Nature Calgary over the last many months, and we will reconvene again in uh, September, and we'll get some nice uh, presentations for you. We haven't quite decided whether it's going to be a hybrid system where maybe the first couple in the fall will be uh, in person and the last two or three in the spring will be in person, and all the other ones will be on Zoom. Um, so we'll have to think about that and uh, whether we, we do that or not. I think the Zoom idea is kind of fun because if there's people who don't want to drive at night or it's bad weather, uh, people can attend their talks and not have to worry about that sort of stuff. So, but we'll be looking into that and let you know in, in the fullness of time as to how we're going to be doing this. So um, I hope uh, anyways, that you have a chance to go see our, our, a lot of our field trips are coming up and get a chance to enjoy them. And certainly uh, I, I thank all the field trip leaders that provide that opportunity for us to enjoy nature here in Calgary and, and even outside the city. So um, all I can say is uh, I thank you very much. And um, I guess there's a hockey game on that some of you might want to tune into now. So uh, I hope uh, 
things that would go well there as well. So all I can say is uh, thank you very much. And I will end our, uh, our meeting tonight and have a great summer, everybody. Bye.